Um, and first of all, Paul should have the chance to get his questions from you guys um, that you've discussed. So, and then we'll open the panel to everybody. So questions for Paul, please. You get the microphone, yeah, Marcus? Thank you, and Paul, thank you very much for a very, very interesting um, talk. I was very intrigued, sparked a lot of thinking, especially when you mentioned um, the term of introducing intentionally a stress factor and what that does for the continuing process. With that in mind, would you consider climate change a stress factor and therefore being something good for humanity? <laughs> that's, that's excellent thinking, thank you. Yes, of course, it, it is. In fact, it is. I, 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 I will not uh, speculate on any uh, reason but it is a stress factor, yes, and we respond to it. I mean, we respond to it as human beings, I mean, we, just the same as whales are responding to it and, and others. And as you, I've seen these documentaries on the geological extinctions. We already had five extinctions eh, on, the, on the planet, and they went over the top. Well, there were millions of years in between, so I don't wish we will head into that. So I, I hope it will, it will be below tipping point. But yes, it is. If you see it as a stress reaction, it is it's probably less nerve-wracking, nerve is it? <laughs> Another question from the audience to Paul before we open the panel. No more questions? Everybody's waiting for things to happen. Okay, please, uh, whenever you should have a question, don't hesitate to raise your hand and just interfere. Actually, I was thinking about do, doing a fishbowl discussion, but that's too late right now. Um, you know, first of all, as I said, I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank you because, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm completely confused now after all these lectures. Uh, I had some clear questions this morning when we started off. Now, you, you blew me apart, um, and I have no idea how to, how can I say, um, how to organize, <laughs> organize my thoughts around everything I heard. It's very enriching, but at the t same time, it's very confusing. I would like to, if you, if you don't mind, nevertheless insist on, <laughs> on an answer to one of the questions I had in the morning. I showed you that, you know, when I, when I was a student, uh, there was a big belief in technology, and technology will save it, and we will get technologically a lot better, and so on. And I showed you that from my experience, technology did not do the job. Well, it saved a few things. Okay, we closed the ozone hole. All right, perfect. That's what we achieved. We're better in communication right now. Okay, that's what we achieved. But generally, I mean, that's what I learned, is that this whole planet is in a situation that never had been in before. And this is a, a crucial change that we had. So. My, my question was, if technology in the last decades did not really do the job, are you sure, with all our knowledge we have, with all the new technologies we have, that the next generation technology will do better than the old one? Or do you have an idea why the technological development of the last decades didn't really, how can I say, work out? And I know that's a stupid question, but, but it, it bothers me because I'm sitting in front of the students trying to teach them something, but I can't really teach them because my technology, at least in my, you know, born 1963, didn't do the job. So what are we going to do? And, and I, I can't promise that the new technology will do it. So I would like to know a little bit more from you guys. How do you evaluate that situation? And when you talk about the stress level uh, and stress being a, a motivator for something that changes, yes, you're probably right that the climate change is producing a certain amount of stress that will, uh, how do you say, produce a few changes. But, you know, you said, you said it's difficult to find the right stress level. Sorry, maybe this is typical German, uh, German angst movement, <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid that this stress level might be a little bit too much for what we have to offer. But first of all, what is your take on this question? Why did the technological advancement in the last decades didn't do the job? And where do you take the opportunity, the, how do you say, the optimism from that we're going to change it? Um, 
we're going to do it better in the next couple of decades. Yeah. Please be, please be optimistic. Yeah, but you, we, can all, that. we can all uh, answer that. Did you want to answer that? No, go ahead. Okay, so I, I, have, I have a clear answer on that, I think. You know, uh, for if, if technology only failed the last decades, that's, that's, that's a fair perspective. But nature failed us already for millennia. We flat nature because we couldn't survive in nature as we wanted. So uh, the crisis was for a long time not with technology, but it was with nature itself. Nature is very harsh. It's very, very, it's not, it's not uh, making humans very comfortable. So it's very logical that we as humans try to, well, to, to try to find a balance. And I think where the balance left us, because for a long time we had the highest biodiversity when we as humans were agriculturally involved, so we were very native to our land, so let's say. We had a very positive effect on, on biodiversity and life. So it's, and that is also due to technique. So I think we can do it, but what happened in the last 10, 20, 30 years is neoliberalism. We had a certain political system that allowed free market and forgot about all the things we have to keep in check and balances within the larger group, because otherwise, you know, that's, so the, the, the danger is not technology, the danger is in the type of policy and the type of re, re, uh, almost uh, uh, maybe even religious aspect of driving politics. That's why I got interested in policy more than in technique. Um, I, I was going to say that I think that um, in the framing of the question is the problem. We treat the problem that we haven't solved or that technology hasn't solved as a fixed problem and it's not. And I think Paul's introduction, this, this, this idea of the right level of stress is about actually that ecology is not a fixed thing. You never know what it will do. So when we talk about why didn't technology fix the problem, well, because we didn't know what the problem was, and then it changed, and then we tried to fix that, and then we try, tried to change again. So I think if we say we think ecologically, right, we will never find a solution. The solution just leads to the next problem. And, and maybe it's even wrong to, to, to characterise it as a problem. You know, it's, it's evolution. And um, thinking along the lines of an ecological system means that you do the, the job, you, you make the tidal polder, and then you wait for the next thing you've got to address when that happens. So, um, and, and I think that that's one thing that sets landscape architecture apart from a lot of the other design professions, that we learn to think of this thing that we design something, it gets built, and then it keeps changing. So, I mean, I, I think there's some things, some technologies that might prove fundamentally important. And I'll take the example of nuclear fusion energy, right? The, the potentially, the source of ultimate clean energy that could replace all forms of energy. It, you know, solar has its shortcomings because it doesn't, sun doesn't shine all the time. Wind doesn't always blow all the time. So let's say something that fundamentally significant happens and happens at a scale that you, you replace the entire energy supply, that finds its way through all the other systems. All of a sudden, water doesn't need dirty energy to become potable. And, you know, uh, food can be grown indoors, even though it's not the most um, naturally adaptive system. So I, I think it, it's... We have to make the problem small enough to, for the technology to fix it. If I can just respond. I think it's important to go back to uh, the political nature of this question as well. And I think what I tried to show in my talk is that technology is deeply implicated in the governance of specific situations. So if we're talking about specific stress levels, let's be real about who's actually impacted by climate change. I think all of us have felt the impacts of climate change 
in our lifetimes, yet we know that others are disproportionately impacted. So, uh, Aesam, your uh, slides about 10,000 people dying in one day, that's absolutely unjust. That should not happen. Uh, the Maui wildfire in Hawaii, right, where over 100 people are killed in, in Inferno, also not okay. So there are very important implications of this stress factor, and we know that technology can't solve all of the problems. In fact, we have a lot of technology to solve issues, but we haven't actually been able to achieve that, and that is because we have a crisis of governance. We have not been smart enough or adept enough to connect our very subjective feelings and perceptions around these problems and these solutions to a broader political discourse. And that's where we actually need to go. And technology can be a part of that. It can also aid us in that effort. But we shouldn't pretend that this is apolitical or that it's just a system. The system is absolutely political. If I may say, uh, being from uh, Department of Electrical Engineering and the radar division in NASA. Technology is not one thing. Uh, we cannot compare today the solar energy to the, the vapor machine that, work, that was working with coil. Uh, I think uh, where we need that people need that technology is a tool. It cannot substitute our uh, perception and our understanding of the risks of the nature. So you have a tool, it can help you, but the tool cannot do your job. And the problem is that the more technology we have, the more we relax our understanding of risks, of nature, of details. And we take, we, we take these for granted, which they are not. Um, so I've worked 20 years in the in understanding the natural disasters ar around the globe, from volcanoes in the Reunion Islands, in Hawaii, flood, earthquakes, uh, and all the people that I saw have been on the ground in some of the, of the operation, and all the people I saw that in these disaster zone, they share one thing in common, all of them, whether in Asia, Egypt, Africa, the US, all of them did not did not b b b believe that they will die in this way. All of them, that they thought that this would not happen to them. They are under the shock. They, they feel b b b betrayed by the local entities because they did not alert them enough, but if they do. Like the case in Libya, in the Dharna in Libya, <coughs> we just watched one month ago, people say, if the population was alerted, we could save life. Actually, it's the opposite. If the population was alerted, they may or may not listen to this alert because they never seen this. And if they listened, the chaos in the evacuation, we don't, there is no evacuation route, the evacuation plan would create as much disaster. So it was too late. You died when you closed your schools and universities, and when you did not change your curriculum you teach to adapt to the changing planet. So I believe the solution here is here in universities. We need to educate our students that the future which they are landscaping for will be different. It's not, it's, it is not, it is different or not. It will, all models, all observations in climate research shows that uh, what is coming next, what is now, is different to what was 50 years ago. So um, please raise your hand if you would like to participate in the discussion. We don't have to do this up here. That's why I'm every once in a while looking to the audience. Uh, j just to sort of um, pick on that once again, uh, Natalie, what you said I think is, is something uh, very crucial that we have to see the, let's say, the political and social context in which technology is implemented and what kind of effects it has. And uh, it's not the tools that matter, but maybe the way how it's used in which specific context. Let me get a little bit, how can I say, very concrete. I should, I'd, I'd like to ask you that. In about two weeks, I'm going to invite a young student. Uh, she's active in the so-called last generation movement. Maybe you heard about these guys. Uh, young student, 25 years old absolutely, how can I say, horrified 
by the reaction of the society to what happens out there. Um, and she's kind of taking personal risks, going to jail, uh, being run over by uh, you know, car drivers or whatsoever. Um, because she says, and she, she's not studying landscape architecture, even though her father is a landscape architect, because she said, no, too much talking, not enough action, we need to do something. But what would be, I'm very interested to, to see her talk to our own students, right? There's a student who takes personal risk because he or she is afraid. And I think she will not be very happy if I say, well, you know, it's just evolution, live with it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm making things a little bit more, uh, I'm sharpening a little bit. But what would be, um, maybe your answer to a student who is really personally in a situation where he or, she, he or she thinks there is no alternative? How would you try to sort of, you know, open a window for uh, new activities? And, and they go to the streets because they think the political system is ignoring it because they go to the streets because they think the political system is there to make people, you know, keep them in their comfort zone. Don't, 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 you know, don't, don't wake them up. Let them just dream on forever. Do you have an advice? What would you tell such a young person who says like, wait a minute, too much talking, not enough action. What can I do instead of gluing myself to the street? Okay. <laughs> Uh, maybe I don't have a, a perfect answer for the question, but in China, um, we will also have a saying about, uh, uh, maybe I say the Chinese first, we call it zhi xing he yi. That means, uh, I would say you understand the word and also take the action. So uh, you need to know the word first. Or, or maybe you need to act a little bit first, just like Paul said, you need a small stress. So um, everything is horrible when you, you know, uh, how to say, step out your comfort zone to face something you, know, you don't know, uh, you will be horrible. That's the real answer of the human beings. But the only solution is to try to step the first step and to see the, you know, to understand what will happen and uh, to take the next step. So what, what I say is maybe it's also very, you know, uh, prog pragmatical uh, solution to this question is you did something slowly, cautiously, uh, small steps and see what will happen. That's the, maybe it's a pragmatical answer to the questions. But actually, I'm very interested to, you know, first and the second questions, uh, how about we deal with, the, you know, the uh, environmental crisis, how about to look at the technologies. I don't really have a uh, you know, perfect answer. I may, maybe I want to say yes or no. For example, we, we actually know how to do it. I mean, sometimes uh, even there is a crisis, it's a you know, very important uh, problems we need to solve it, but actually it's really an easy way. Just, let, just like the legislature do the work, it's very simple. It's a, Almost, I can say it's common sense. But the problem is, we don't do it. I don't know why, because maybe more about the society, the politics, we know it's wrong, but we did it. That's the problem. That's my answer so for the no, but we actually know many things how to do it, but we don't do it. We did it wrong in the landscape, in the urban planning, in the architecture design. We know it's wrong, but we did it for the wrong target, for the wrong, you know, maybe uh, we say it's the, how to say, the problem of the capitalism, the con consumerism, something, everything like that. But when, you know, we have people as a, you know, society, we do the wrong thing, we know. That's the problem. That's my answer. Yeah, if I could build off of that, 
I think my response to the student might be, thank you for bringing your perspective forward. Thank you for your activism. And is a planner or somebody who's trying to uh, facilitate a process, I might want to listen to her and to other youth who are saying the same things. And I think we actually have to be much better at listening and incorporating that perspective and that knowledge of intergenerational justice because that's what she's asking for, right? She's asking for a better future, a more hopeful future. She can't see the pathways. It's actually our responsibility to respond to that. And in a society that purports we move, we're moving towards justice, we're moving towards equity, we're moving towards a better future, we actually have to do that. And we can do much better. And we know how to do that as well. Um, it's a question of value and where we put our values, where we place our money, uh, and that's what we should be thinking about. I just want to sort of touch on that as well. I think that um, what your student is doing is reconnecting with what we used to do. And we've spent the last few centuries moving from the system that you were describing, Paul, of we did it all ourselves, we were connected to it, we, and, you know, you look at the Dutch polders as a great example. 500 years ago, people knew how to respond to sea level rise, and they just got up and did it. They self-organised, they did it themselves. Now, I think that what has been happening in the last few hundred years is this gradual progression towards specialisation in economics. And we've gotten to this point where we think the problem of climate change is so big, only government can, can address it. But I think that the student's message is really important. We actually have to remember we have agency. We can do things. I, I, I look at Ilka's artworks and I see that as personal action. It, it, it disturbs me. And so it, it compels me to want to do something. That's also action. So I think if we can take responsibility and say, we used to do this before. Our ancestors knew how to do this. Let's stop pretending we can't make a difference. And I would encourage the student in that, in that way. Wouldn't encourage her to get herself arrested, but um, you know, I think that it is important that we, we take personal ownership. Hi. Um, so when, when talking about climate change, I would argue it's always also a perspective from storytelling. So it's, it's one kind of a story to say that we have a demonic approach that the world is going to end. And connecting that to the idea of what you've said before on um, entering a bit of stress into a system, I would say it's then it becomes really difficult to execute on this amount of stress because it's such a, a huge is issue. On the other hand, uh, we have kind of this hippie attitude that says, okay, um, let's, let's kill the capitalism system and uh, let's go all into the forest and start communes and live without technology. So <laughs> I guess both approaches are a bit polarized, so I would uh, wonder what kind of story you would like to to be told on, on climate change, to be able to execute. Yes, this is, this is actually my, this will be my research question for the coming two years. So how can you, because I'm a, I like both aspects. I like going to the forest and leave the whole be world behind. And I do that for a couple of weeks uh, every year. You probably all do that. So this is something that, uh, that is uh, probably helpful, healing. But it's not a solution. And it's certainly not a solution for the whole planet. So the difficulty is that we've reached a planetary level of organization. There's no doubt about it. We re we've reached the level of planetary involvement as a species. You are, you are not alone, you are, you are part of a chain. So uh, this is a very difficult uh, dilemma, and, I'm not, and I'm, I'm not sure, but we need both. We need both the system understanding and being native. So, so uh, I have three children, and I give them this advice the moment they turn 18. So maybe that's, that's the best answer I can give. So whatever you do, uh, you should do three things. You should do 
you should develop something that you are really well at with your hands and with your body so that you, 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 can, you can be uh, involved into making things immediately. So it can be anything, repairing bikes or having honeybees or you should really invest in that. And that's maybe the more, more the native type. Then everyone has a big set of brains, intelligence. There's no one on the planet, uh, no human being born without brains. So develop them. And there's, there's no better opportunity now than, than, than you can share ev everything anywhere by internet. It's, it's the greatest tool we ever built for, for that kind of development. So invest in that. Be interested. And then the last thing is that you should be able to move others. You should either play a musical instrument or, or be on stage or you should invest making others aroused. So if you do that, then you are a wonderful human being and, and they can throw you any problem. So I think for the whole humanity, that would be my answer at the moment. Huh? So, but it is a development plan. It's not a solution. It's a de development plan. Yes, uh, if, I'm, if I may also add, I know that many times <coughs> it seems like a joke that our the life on planet or life on our planet can end. And this joke is made because we can look back to history thousands of years ago. And we say we're going to be here thousands of the next future. And I mean, being Egyptian, there is a 7,000 year of civilization. So I may think that 7,000 year maybe will come in the future. But I can guarantee for you as a scientist, if we stay in this way, there will be no thousand years ahead of us. And uh, did, is this real? Let me give you an example. Uh, the, the, the dinosaurs existed 80 million years ago. They were stronger than you and I. They were most, in, in number, they outpassed human beings. And yet, one asteroid was able to make them disappear from the planet of the Earth. In 1994, an asteroid named Levi Shoemaker 2 entered the solar system, and uh, it got attracted by the, by the gravity of Jupiter, and we watched that asteroid dissociated in 12 pieces and entering and hit uh, uh, Jupiter. Now, if by luck Jupiter was not there at that moment, this asteroid could come to our planet. So these risks exist, and uh, there will be no second chance to learn. It's one time, and it's game over. One student have told me, actually not student, he was my line manager. So he told me, but these things happen only in science fiction movie. Told him, yes, but in science fiction movie, at the end, you're alive. In reality, you're not, go you're dead. And so climate change, the, the worst thing about it is that it's not happening in our urban areas. It's happening in Antarctica, where the ice are melting very fast. The ice is breaking very fast in the Greenland, where the snow is melting very fast, and these are away from our eyes. And we are slowly feeling the effects in many areas around the globe. And so nature is giving us this warning, little by little, in Libya, in Morocco, in Turkey. And so if we turn our back to, to there, yes, we can meet the same destiny as the dinosaurs, very quickly. And so I think we, I don't take life for granted at all. And we shouldn't. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, um, I would like to continue a bit on the same topic, but a bit shifted towards another, let's say, disagreement that I also noticed, which is, so Paul Ronken told us at the very end that our, our knowledge is 50 years old, but our landscape is like 50 years ahead. And then at the same time, we heard from, from you, S.M. Hege, that um, you know, the only way to save our planet is to know. So now I'm asking, do we know enough to save our planet? Or do we, do we still need to keep on collecting data in order to find the right solution? Do we have the right solution? Or how, how do you see A it? very short answer. We need to make a landscape that makes us knowledgeable. 
if the landscape is fooling the people, I mean, if you are in the Sahara or in Los Angeles and you see pine trees and alpine trees that are green uh, at all seasons, you are fooling the people that there is a drought that has been in the state for three years. And, uh, and your landscape, I mean, including my house landscape, uh, which, um, I mean, I didn't uh, put in place, is fooling us. And so people ask why we need to save water. I mean, it's, uh, and then because you're in a desert, Southern California, unfortunately, it is a desert, but it is the biggest landscaping that, uh, to my knowledge, that exists anywhere with all these exported, uh, the trees, the, the palms, that are fooling people that actually they have a lot of water. In the Gulf area, we've seen this, this, the same thing, the huge, the green areas, which also do not alarm people about, about their water stress, about their climatic changes. So maybe I'm not a landscape architect, but I would suggest that we make this landscape a way to educate people in uh, vulnerable areas. I was just going to say one thing, and let's be clear here, folks. We are not going to save the planet ever. The planet doesn't need us to save it. We need to act so that we survive. Nature will continue. The planet will still be here. It's, it's us that will disappear, and that's just Earth hitting reset, and it'll start again. So after the dinosaurs died away, this planet didn't, did, didn't fade into oblivion. It won't again. Let's be real. This is about us. Take responsibility for us and act. And I'd like to add to that and just say there's many dystopic narratives uh, that dominate media and our way of discussing the future. But I think it's actually our imperative, specifically as people living in the global north, with many resources, with agency, with the opportunity, the education to actually act, to be hopeful. And to, I think, building off of what Paul was suggesting, his advice to his children is actually a really interesting development plan to adaptation. And that's actually what we need to be thinking about. Because the uh, carbon gases uh, for the next 20 to 30 years are built into our system now. We're not going to change that. So we can look forward to 30 years of a changing climate at least, probably much more, because we're not going to figure it out how to uh, change the systems lock that we're in right now. So it's actually our burden or our responsibility to start to adapt and to understand what it means to live in a changing climate and to do that in solidarity with the weakest, right? This is our ethical imperative to actually understand what that means. So it could be changing our consumption and production patterns, but it also can be building community, reaching out to those who need a voice, and understanding how you can activate your education and all of your gifts in the world to not only serve yourself, but to serve others. Yeah, I fully agree. So, um, I, but I do think we also need some knowledge still on some subjects. For instance, I, I was very surprised that in the Netherlands, uh, this, this, ha this story has two uh, interesting elements. So one is the activist element. People ha have gotten activists. They don't wait for the government, they go to courts. And one court uh, appeal has been so successful that it, uh, that it has laid down every work in the Netherlands. So we, we're not building anything for 10 years. No road, no building, no whatever, because there was a, a civil uh, court appeal on the level of uh, um, nitrogen in the air, okay? This brought to light a thing that we didn't understand, actually. So we, we, we now are reworking with knowledge on how we actually, how are we with our actions as humans involved with the quality of soil? We don't really know yet. Soil has been a recent discovery, you could say. So the, the fact that soil is full of life, full of my, micro... Uh, Mycorrhiza and uh, microbiomes is a relatively new field of science, and I do think we need more knowledge on that. So that's one of the one of the few fields that that we really lag behind. So I would invest in that, and that could be 
compare, com combine with, with landscape architecture, I think. Or at least you could, you could, you could work in an, in an office that, that collaborates with soil. Uh, but for the rest, uh, you, if you are a landscape architect, you are already, uh, I, I think you are already blissed. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the best. You, if you want to do good for the world, that's a very good profession. We already said that. Huh? So you can also de-stress from that. Well, 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 since we have a lot of uh, first semester students here who are still searching for orientation, I wouldn't let you off the hook so easily, to be honest. Um, so from your, especially from your perspective, Paul, um, what would you recommend we need to change in the education of young landscape architects? Because you said, yes, landscape architects are, you know, better off because they understand complexity, they have understanding for the environment, the social aspect is normally always there because you, you, you can, well, Ilka is the only one who's out there alone in the landscape, but I think even he has to, every once in a while, interact with, uh, with society, right? Um, but um, what, what would you change in current landscape architecture education? Or for the first semester students, what would you, what, why, what kind of advice would you give them? Shall they invest more energy in understanding geoengineering? Well, that's, that's, uh, I would love to hear uh, Ilka's uh, story. <laughs> I, I will not answer that because I, if I'm very honest, I left university because I was fed up to here with education curricula as it is now. And I don't have an answer. I've been working on improvements within our system. They have failed, all, all of them. So uh, that's a very uh, painful question, actually. So I'm not sure. I do think it will take as long as medical training so medical training is one of the longest trainings you can have, and it's very logical because you have to understand the human body, you have to work with the human body, you have to understand uh, the, the complexity of uh, collaborating in, in, a, in, a, in a medical center. This has very much same learning elements. So I do believe it cannot be done in five years. It needs much longer time. And then if, we, if, if, if you would position me in that frame, then we can fantasize about improving it. But improving it within the five-year frame is rather impossible. We pushed it here to six years, but that's probably still not enough. <laughs> yeah, so yes, I have a comment uh, I would like to make. That to make the, the population sensitive to the educational change in landscape and environmental research and geoscience, I think one of the best way I've seen today is the art. And actually, the, everybody is sensitive to art, but not everybody is sensitive to science. And the art is a language we should be using more frequently to communicate that, uh, that uh, per the perception of our planet. One additional language is media. Of course, media is not is not always available to talk about uh, these questions. And if we were here to talk about uh, the soccer or football, we have a pile of media ahead of us. But art can break that circle, I believe. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, of course, art is affecting things. And well, I do, I do pictures, but uh, this uh, expertise you have is a little bit beyond my uh, scope, so <laughs> you can continue. <laughs> <laughs> I think more people will look to the pictures and the artwork you do than any of the paper I personally wrote, or any of my colleague would wrote, and would change them. So I, I think in the future, the combination of art and science, this is, will be very, very useful for the society. If I could just add maybe a little bit more to what you were saying is that I think we should invite for interdisciplinarity. So maybe we need new language, right? So we need to look to the humanities to understand how to actually speak about the change that we'll be going through or that we see or that we can feel, which pipes into this kind of multi-sensory ability to understand and perceive, which is what you help us do in many ways, and you open up for new discussions. 
And if we can start to bring those perspectives and channels into education, I think we've come quite a far way. Maybe I just add some of my uh, opinions about the, you know, give the advice to landscape architecture students. Actually, uh, I want to say stick to it. And uh, uh, in China is not a very good time for landscape architecture or even, you know, planning and design uh, discipline. But I think, you know, um, uh, we learn Many, the, I think, is the system uh, thinking method from the discipline, not um, about the you know detailed knowledges of the any kind of you know disciplines, uh, and this will help us to resolve a lot of things. And so we need to you know learn how to think critical thinking, and also to just as other, you know, experts said, we need to not, you know, uh, how to say, to keep us just in our, you know, field. We need to go out to learn a lot of you know, art and science, anything to resolve the problem. And I think we will, you know, um, how to say, uh, really reach the target if we stick to it, yeah. Um, I was just thinking through that question through personal experience. And I think after almost 30 years of working, I think my knowledge feels a thimble, you know, if the world is, is, you know, knowledge. So it's not what I learned at university as a fact. It was the way I learned to think. And I was always told that that's the difference between secondary school and university. In secondary school, you get taught facts. In university, you get taught how to think. And so I think... The, for the beginning of a landscape architecture program, it, there has to be that thought, that, that focus on how to think, how to frame problems, how to actually work your way through a problem. Because I don't start a project knowing the answer. I, I, I formulate an answer through a thought process. Um, and one of the sort of good examples that I've seen personally, uh, the University of Western Australia's landscape architecture program not so much now, but in the past, used to have a very distinct structure that differed from a lot of schools. And a lot of schools start with a small project that is easy to, to sort of teach someone to do. Then you'd get up slightly bigger, slightly more complex project, and eventually you would end with a, a very sort of involved, detailed, ecological uh, sort of thing all the way through to construction. And what they did was invert that. They started with regional ecology at the thousands of square kilometres scale. And, and what that did was actually got people to think about ecology as a process and how to think through that process. And that's why almost always my automatic inclination when I get a project is to zoom out. Understand the dynamics that are happening, then get to the site level and understand how that has an impact on the site. So, I, I mean, obviously, I think get yourself into the habit of thinking, I don't know enough anyway, but I know how to find the answer. Marcus. Yeah, I, um, I want to go back to your question and second what, what Udo said, because I think the question about how to address the problem and how we can bring that question into landscape architecture edu education, for example, it does relate very much, or is very much based on the fact to change the way we teach how we think. We don't need knowledge anymore. We have knowledge in our pocket with the phone. But we don't, we do a very, very bad job at university level to teach people to think differently. And I had the luxury to start off in architecture and then urban planning and end up in landscape. But I noticed as one of the biggest differences is that landscape architecture is still not embracing to teach properly how to think creatively. It's too much based on a linear thinking process which comes out of science and engineering, but it's counterproductive to the complexity of what we are 
facing nowadays. And I think whether it is a more creative way of thinking versus a linear way of thinking or even other models, there are many models. We need to embrace these models and teach different ways to think to students. The root of that is, of course, in philosophy, but I think it needs to be in a time where we need to address these complexities with challenging the way we think. It's not about knowledge anymore. And mm -hmm. just as a second thought to the comment from the young gentleman earlier, my biggest concern in terms of what should we teach the, the, the young generation, my biggest concern, having also a young daughter, is that the young generation, who is already doing an incredible job in terms of getting off the chair, becoming active, is that they will all throw their tools in the sand and say, I give up. It's too big. I can't do anything about the problem. The problem is too big. I give up. I'm frustrated. I'm depressed. That is my biggest concern. And I think we need to learn as humans to find the balance between motivation to solve the problem and our own psychological well-being, which I think is becoming more and more a problem nowadays. That people, where you look around, everyone is just going home and putting their head in the pillow because the problem is appearing so big and we can't afford that. I'd like to, I, I remembered one lesson also from, from doing these complex projects on landscape machines. It took always two years in the thesis phase, so that is uh, four times uh, too much, uh, because you need to do a th thesis in, in six months. That's impossible. So it took two years, and it took uh, two person at this, uh, as a team. So we never did a landscape machine with one person only. So it had, it had a team, and then with two, sometimes three, and then they interacted with all the specialists, and, and, and so it, it takes time. Hmm? So, but there's two lessons. Uh, it takes time, you should have that time, and it, and it takes teamwork, yes. And teamwork is, is, uh, is, is, is very good. If you learn how to co-knowledge with a person, then you have already gained a very fundamental human capacity. Now, in university, everything is individualized. Well, in our university, yeah. Not with you? So tell me, no. what, what, what do you want to change uh, at your university? No, I'm, at, <laughs> the, I'm, I'm very happy about the responses. Um, of course, I have my, my, my personal story in the back of my mind. I'm teaching at the Technical University of Munich, okay? Your vote to say we need an artistic approach, we need a, a, a an artistic, not create an artistic approach. We need to understand more about arts, about inventing things. In 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 an art world, is very important for me. A very important statement, because um, we. How can I say? Uh, it's these days. It's very tough at the at the technical university to get support for anything which is not technically or technologically or economically. Uh, at the first hand, how do you say, profitable. And that's why I, I, I love the comment, as some thanks a lot also for, for telling us, like, you know, uh, we're communicating with our design and we need to sort of be honest to the people we communicate with. I, I'm afraid there is still a big of, uh, how can I say, fake <laughs> messages out there when I look in the commercial landscape that's being produced out there. I don't think it's honest. I think it's, it's, it's very much, uh, how do you say, um, it's very much, uh, how do you say, connected to economic interests. And this is exactly what um, the society momentarily is asking for, but I don't want to go too much into detail. But this is a very important thing, you know? I mean, like, to get the message from this board to say, listen, if you want to educate good landscape architects for the future, it's not enough to teach technology. No. You need to have these other creative, you know, activities. And I think that's very good also for the student to know that, because Unfortunately, even students sometimes react critically. They say, why do we do these you know, strange things that we're doing? You know, how can we use this later on? How do I earn my money by you know, inventing stuff? For example, we're doing every semester, we did it last yesterday or the day before yesterday, we're asking the students to develop a so-called inventive analysis, which means don't use the standard techniques, invent something 
to get to know something that you haven't, you have no, you know, other other media for. This is coming, you know, from my good old friend Bernard Lassus, who says we have to be inventive because we cannot simply reconstruct the landscape of yesterday, and the landscape of tomorrow is a mystery. So we have to be inventive, and to be inventive, it needs some kind of aesthetical teaching. It needs an idea about what arts and aesthetics is all about, but. Personally speaking, I feel in these times where everybody is, you know, asking for more data, more for facts and figures and calculations and so on, it's super tough to really, how can I say, keep, keep this inventive, playful, creative work going at a technical university in a society that is permanently asking more for proof. Prove it. I said, no one trusts you, you know, if you, if you, don't, if you can't prove it. And that's why um, I, I like your answers. I wish we could make the education longer, no question. We were fighting here to make it longer than in other universities in Germany. But even then, someone comes in and says, you know, educating student, that's, a, that's an economic question. I mean, the more years you spend, the more it costs, and students are a cost factor. It's not a, you know, it's not nothing that pays. You don't get, you don't get, I don't know, research money, millions of euros because you're educating students. And this is a little bit the political aspect that you were aiming at, and, and that's why I'm, I'm very happy about this message because I think it will be helpful for our students to understand that what they're doing, landscape architecture, actually is a political, is a political subject. It's not something that you can sort of stay in your comfort zone and say, oh, I'm drawing nice paintings and that's it. No, and that's why I'm also very curious to have this, how do you say, young activist with us in a few weeks to say like, now here's political activism. What do you think about that? I just want to respond to some of the comments that we've heard, specifically this concern for the future, concern for our health and the well-being of our own children, but also of others. And I think something that we can bring into a landscape architecture education would be that, okay, as landscape architects, you're actually trained to respond to the market, right? Mm -hmm. You're coming out, you're doing something that has to do with development, which is oftentimes driven by market-based principles. It's important to understand that, and it's important to know how to react to that. Yet at the same time, we have the opportunity within an educational context to cultivate new principles of value. And here I would like to introduce the idea that we could be much more acquainted with feminist principles of care. Now, why is that important? I think it's important because of the comments that we've heard in the audience today and the reality that we understand from our gut of what it means to live in this situation, whereby we understand that other species need to be equal at the table, right? We call this the post-human design language or a scenario where uh, the picture is much bigger, the audience is bigger. That means being attentive to others, right? Outside of the human sphere, learning that language, learning to listen, but also learning to listen to each other and cultivating principles of empathy and also empowerment in sitting with what Donna Haraway, because she's been present today in so many discussions, she calls sitting with the trouble, staying with the trouble, right? Uh, Many people who have been dealing with oppression throughout history have had to sit with trouble forever. Some of us are just learning what it means to sit with the trouble. And it's our opportunity to learn what that feels like and then to support each other through that process. And this is what feminists have been talking about for a really long time. There's wonderful, rich literature on this. Recently, the journal Cities did a whole uh, series on the caring city. I would encourage you to read that, but also to think about how care links to issues of regenerative futures that many of us have been speaking about today as well. So we can also think about how the welfare state in a European context provides infrastructural and institutional care and what that means and what the limits of that are as well. So by providing these new principles and values in an educational system, we equip students and ourselves to understand that value actually is very diverse and that while market values might dominate currently in our discourse, we have the opportunity to change that, also in terms of the way in which we vote, but more importantly, the way in which we imagine the future. Can I just come back very quickly? Um, because I think it's an important point about education. The Yes, this is a technical university, but um, it's because we're, we're separating things like art 
perception, humanities from the creative process of science and, and technology and development. And there's a really interesting case study, and I think Professor Dosing brought it up, uh, of Neri Oxman at the MIT Mediated Matter Lab. And she has a, a really interesting diagram that explains their process, where it, it sort of mediates between an arc of, um, essentially art and philosophy is the way to understand, and science and technology is the way to create. But they're in a constant dialogue, and we know that from, from what we see. But I think if you, if, if you have, the best time I've ever understood the complexity of their approach is that there's a Netflix special uh, on designers and creators, uh, and she's in one of them. And she explains this process through the lens of some of their projects. And I think it, what it did to me was to say, okay, we no, no longer have an excuse to say it's either technology or art. I think that uh, we, we, take, we need to take ownership of it. They're, they're both part of our wheelhouse and there is ways that we can do it. So, I mean, I think in a way that, that fights against the traditions of landscape architectural education. Hello, yeah, I, um, I'm personally educated at ETH Zurich, so I very much understand that issue of being at a technical university, at the engineering faculty, but actually doing like urban planning, urban design, something somewhere in the middle. And what I even would like to think about is, or I think we need a totally different sort of um, study program. So I think like every time I'm in, uh, now I'm in a landscape architecture symposium, then I'm in an urban design symposium, and every time I think the discussion is more about like how to uh, restructure that specific discipline or the education within a discipline. But actually what I, what my personal experience is of always trying to figure out where do I fit actually best with the things I'm interested in is that kind of we need a, a study program which combines multiple things. So we need to have the design approach, the art approach, we need something from landscape architecture, from large scale thinking, but also maybe on urban planning, on urban design. So if we're talking about what would be the ideal future of the education on, on these issues, I think it's not even about specifically disciplines, but about really going across those disciplinary borders and yeah, define also something new. Yes, uh, I would like to say one word for the students, as we have so many of the young students, and every time I see the young students, I just remember when I was in their age. And as we talk about education, I think the one message I want to say when I was in your age, uh, a fresh student at the university, uh, we are very specialized, or we, we tend to people to be very specialized. They don't, and they think, youth might think that your classes is a lot you're bored, you have too much on your plate. When I was, um, when I, when I, when I uh, joined the Sorbonne University uh, in France, when I was coming uh, from Egypt, so I felt that I was lucky. I was going to all classes, my classes and other classes. I was in geology, but I was taking classes in astronomy, in electrical engineering. I was everywhere at the university because I felt I was lucky to have this education for free. And uh, the one thing I learned during my education, which also changed my life and my, my advice to you, so while all this education process, the one thing I was sure of is that I have no future. Because in any way, I mean, whatever I learned, I will go back and work in my, my Little Water Research Center. My grant was, was a grant for developing nation, so anyway, you will go back and work in that center and just find your little water for the oasis you came from, and that's it. I wasn't realizing that 10 years after, I would be making spacecraft that land on the moon, that I will build the radar that go on Mars, including contributing with the Indian Space Agency for the Chandrayaan-3 radar, which landing on the moon uh, one month ago. And I think the lesson here is that your education is your curiosity. And if you don't, and education is not an answer to someone who have no questions. You need to develop your curiosity and, de and you can only develop that with, be, with go to see the uh, other the disciplines. 
Uh, so you are in an engineering school, but you go to art, you see exposition, you go to the law school and listen to lectures. Don't say, I'm overwhelmed, I have a lot on my plate, uh, I want to leave, I want to know what this will help me in. Life has no guarantee at all. And if you think that you're going to take any curriculum or any classes that will guarantee for you a job, you're wrong. The only thing that guarantees a future for you is your curiosity. And so develop that and don't lose it at any process of your life. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think yes, that was uh, the, the, the perfect, the perfect uh, how do you say, closing comment for our little discussion here on the panel, uh, which gives me the opportunity to uh, thank once again um, to the audience that you all showed up, thanks to the students and everybody who came here to spend this day with us. Um, I think you were driven by curiosity, so you are the chosen ones, you did it, great. And I think uh, if you feel almost the same that I do, you probably learned a lot. I learned a lot, actually, and I, I'm going to have a very bad night because I have to think a lot about, about a lot of things now.